Makes Me Wanna Holler by Nathan McCall, Chapter 2, Cavalier Manor. For as long as I can remember, it seems that there was no aspect of my family's reality that wasn't affected by whites, right on down to the creation of the neighborhood I grew up in. Known as Cavalier Manor, it was located in Portsmouth, Virginia. Most of Cavalier Manor was built in the early 1960s by a local construction bigwig named George T. McLean. Neighborhood lore had it that he was a white liberal do-gooder who felt blacks in Portsmouth needed a community that would inspire pride and help improve their lot. But just as many people thought McLean was a racist who got alarmed by the civil rights movement and built Cavalier Manor to encourage blacks to move there rather into white neighborhoods. McLean started building from the edge of an older, low-income black neighborhood and went southward, making the houses larger and more elegant with each successive phase. He named the streets after U.S. presidents and prominent blacks, particularly entertainers. The streets has names such as Belafonte Drive, Basie Crescent, Eckenstein Drive, and Horn Avenue. To add to the sense of optimism that the neighborhood was supposed to reflect, they even named one street Freedom Avenue. Although some folks were like to think of themselves as middle class, Cavalier Manor was a working class neighborhood. Most of those who moved there were active or retired military personnel. Few had completed high school or gone to college. The retirees usually found blue collar jobs at one of the massive military installations in the area, which is home to some of the world's largest shipyards. Many others who moved there were uneducated working class folks who had scrimped and saved enough money to move from public housing. By the time the bulk of it was finished, Cavalier Manor had come to be one of the largest black neighborhoods in the southeast. In terms of political power, this meant that our neighborhood emerged as a potentially influential voting bloc. In terms of street power, it meant that Cavalier Manor surfaced as a hell of a gang force throughout the Tidewater area, which spans several Virginia cities. The neighborhood was so big that dudes, from, that dudes formed distinct gangs in different sections of the community. These gangs fought each other sometimes and united when fighting downtown boys. But I was unaware of all that street action when we first came to Cavalier Manor. I was only nine years old then, in 1964, the year my family moved to Portsmouth from Key West, Florida, where my stepfather had served a three-year tour of duty in the Navy. We'd also lived in Morocco and Norfolk, Virginia, and Portsmouth was to be my stepfather's last duty station before he retired after giving Uncle Sam 20 years. I still remember how excited my brothers and I were about moving into our first real house. When we drove into our neighborhood, our eyes and mouths flew wide open. We saw impressive homes with freshly sprouted lawns, broad sidewalks, and newly paved streets. On each side of the street that led to our section of the community were two sets of stately white brick pillars with black cast iron bars flowing regally through their tops. A huge sign printed in old English letters was mounted on each of the pillars. Welcome to Cavalier Manor. My brothers and I thought that we had died and gone to heaven. It wasn't the kind of neighborhood I associated with black people then. We'd always lived in drab apartment buildings that looked like public housing. All the black people we knew had lived that way. In Cavalier Manor, we pulled into our very own driveway, which led to a garage where we could park our ride. When we walked into the house, the sun shone brightly through the windows, bringing out every wonderful detail of the place. It was a single story structure with three bedrooms, a living room, a kitchen, and a formal dining room. I could feel this newness and smell the freshness of the recently painted walls and ceilings. The hardwood floors had been sanded and buffed. Tiny mounds of sawdust remained in corners 
as if construction workers had left only hours before we arrived. My brothers and I ran outside to inspect our front and back yards. The air was filled with the steady hum of lawnmowers and the sweet smell of freshly cut grass. Pine needles that had fallen from the many trees out back were scattered everywhere. We learned to hate raking those pine needles, but our initial reaction to our new home and neighborhood was that we loved everything. Located in a cul-de-sac named Vaughn Court, ours was one of several streets that the white folks misspelled in their haste. There were 12 homes in the court. We lived in number six. Several blocks away, a large lake, Crystal Lake, wound through a portion of the neighborhood. We got that house just in time to accommodate the expansion of our family. Along with my parents, there were my two brothers, Dwight and Billy, who were two and four years older than me respectively. A short time after we arrived, my mother gave birth to another boy, the first child born to her and my stepfather. They named him Brian Keith Alvin, after Brian Keith, the white actor. As she had in the past, my maternal grandmother, whom we called Bampoos, came to live with us. Then my stepfather took in Junie, a son from his previous marriage who was three years older than me. So within the first year we were living there, our family nearly doubled in size. It was crowded and we were broke as hell, but it felt like we were living large. In those first few years, Cavalier Manor offered a Huck Finn kind of existence for my brothers and me. I hung with Dwight and Greg, an only child who lived across the street. They were my initial tickets into the world beyond our street. They were both two years older than me and were often forced by my parents to let me hang with them. Billy and Junie, who considered themselves bona fide teenagers, developed their own circles of friends. We did everything, mostly innocent mischief. We skipped Sunday services at the neighborhood Presbyterian church to explore construction sites, climb on house frames, and throw dirt bombs at each other until construction supervisors came and chased us off. We went on expeditions into the nearby neighborhood woods and played cowboys and Indians with cherry poppers, reeds that we hollowed out and used to shoot berries at each other. We even ventured to Crystal Lake and Skinny Dip whenever we could evade grown-ups scouting there to keep children away. We delivered newspapers and mowed neighbors' lawns for spending change rode our bicycles through the streets, and fought and made up at least twice a week. On weekends, we went to the movies or took turns spending the night at each other's homes. And we massacred frogs. Because Cavalier Manor had once been a mass of woods and marsh, the place was crawling with them. We tossed frogs as high in the air as we could and watched them descend, spreading their limbs as though parachuting from an airplane. Then they splatter in the street and cough up their guts. We'd walk over to see how a splatter frog's intestines look. We use those frogs for informal biology experiments. What would happen if you put a black widow spider or 20 red ants in a jar with a frog? How long can a frog float in a jar filled with Kool-Aid without drowning? What would happen if you put a frog in a jar, poured in gasoline and torched it? We answered all those questions and more. We also hopped the back of the candy truck. In those days, every southern black neighborhood had a candy man and a candy lady. The candy lady was usually a housewife who lived in a neighborhood and sold sweets, potato chips, sodas, and other stuff out of her house to earn extra cash. The candy man was a traveling salesman who packed a truck with everything from collard greens, fish, and grocery items to candy, cakes, potato chips, and other children's delights, and drove slowly through neighborhoods ringing the bell. The candy man came through the neighborhood most evenings or nights. We'd wait until he pulled away from the curb after making a stop. Then we'd run and hop onto the back or running board as he picked up speed. It reminded me of TV westerns, where courageous cowboys hop from their white horses onto the running boards of runaway stagecoaches and rescue screaming white ladies inside. At first, we rode for a block or so before leaping off. Then we chanced longer distances. 
dangling off the back of the truck and holding on for dear life. Once, we rode all the way across town. It hadn't occurred to us that the candy man didn't live in Cavalier Manor until he pulled up to a house and turned off the engine. We hopped off the truck and had to walk miles to get back home. There was only so much trouble we can get into in those early days. Cavalier Manor was a neighborhood filled with surrogate parents. People who would punish you like your mama and daddy if they caught you doing wrong. The worst among them were Grace, an ornery old woman who always fussed at us about walking on her grass, and Mrs. Patterson, who seemed to live at her front picture window where she always peered out and caught us throwing rocks on Roosevelt Boulevard. By the time we got home, she would have already called Mama and given her a full report. School was also part of that surrogate system. Most of the teachers at Cavalier Manor Elementary, where I went to fourth and fifth grades, lived in the neighborhood. Those teachers spanked us like we were their own when we acted up in class. If a disciplinary note didn't reach home, teachers were sure to update parents in church or while standing in the checkout line at Earl's supermarket on Victory Boulevard. Some of the parents even took it upon themselves to patrol the neighborhood on school days to make sure we were where we were supposed to be. We kids hated that surrogate system. It seemed that everybody was so nosy and bent on making sure we didn't get away with anything. It was only years later when black communities as we knew them started falling apart that I came to understand the system for the hidden blessings it contained. It had built in mechanisms for reinforcing values and trying to prevent us from becoming the hellions some of us turned out to be. Despite our sense of well-being and cavalier manner, there were two things that reminded us of our shaky place in the world. One was the poor whites who lived nearby in Academy Park. Cavalier Manor was separated from Academy Park by the commercial strip of Victory Boulevard. Blacks in Cavalier Manor lived on one side of Victory Boulevard and whites in Academy Park lived on the other. It was a poetic twist of fate that well-off blacks lived so close to the poorest, scruffiest looking whites in the city. It looked like there was something wrong with that picture, seeing blacks turn their dark, wide noses up at the whites the way they did. Academy Park whites were mad as hell about that, and they made it known. It was rumored that white scrogens sometimes stole into Cavalier Manor at night to terrorize. It was fact that they hurled bottles and bricks when we drove through their neighborhood. The main street through Academy Park offered the shortest route to other parts of the city. Sometimes Black gave in to the temptation to take the shortcut through there to get downtown. Shortly after we moved in, a neighbor warned my parents, be careful not to drive through Academy Park. Them is some mean crackers over there. They'll stone your car and shoot at you for driving through there. One night, when I was about 10 years old, a little girl my age was shot to death while sitting near a picture window in her living room on Freedom Avenue. Nobody was arrested, but people in the neighborhood said they were sure it was the work of one of the jealous crackers from Academy Park. The killing brought home the fact that nice neighborhood or not, we still weren't safe in Cavalier Manor. My mother had trained my brothers and me to be leery of white folks, but she stepped up precautions after the murder. Mama told us not to answer the front door for white folks or Jehovah Witnesses when she or my stepfather were away. Whenever either came to the door, we just peeked through the curtains and kept quiet until they left. Our friends and neighbors were cautious too. We all regarded the sight of white people in the neighborhood as an ominous sign, like rain clouds forming overhead. Whenever a white man came into the cul-de-sac and got out his car, People who were outdoors working in their yards stopped what they were doing and watched to see which house he'd go to. They watched when he left too, then looked at the house he had visited for signs of bad news. Another reminder of the tenuousness of our lives was the big, ugly ditch. It stood prominently in the main thoroughfare as an embarrassing monument to our blackness. That weedy eyesore, which bred snakes and all kinds of rodents, cut straight through the middle of the neighborhood on Cavalier Boulevard. That ditch stood out like a grotesque open wound. The city never completely closed it, 
despite vigorous campaigns by homeowners to get it covered. It was as if the city fathers purposely left it open to make a statement to remind blacks that the community will only be so nice and that no matter how uppity we got in Cavalier Manor, the white folks downtown still called the shots.